relationship with God makes all the difference. Okay, say that part. Relationship with God makes all the difference. All right, so we were, I left off last week. Um, I, we've moved out of Cove, but I, I have to go back and just kind of give you a history, a quick one. Um, that while we were in Eastern Oregon living a beautiful dream come true for our kids and for ourselves, <clears throat> the Lord began to show himself to us in an experiential way. And we were experiencing a thing called serendipity. Say serendipity. serendipity. So the, the, the word serendipity means unexpected favor, unexpected blessing. It was just an unexpected, super cool thing. Nod your head if you've had a, a serendipity in your life. Okay. So he began to pursue us with serendipities. And lots of unexpected favor, and I'm going to just kind of weave that in as we go along. <clears throat> so during this time, and I would say one of the groundbreaking ser serendipities was um, a story about a lost check. So when David and I uh, brought the kids to Cove, we bought a, a double wide that was on a really pretty piece of property. And in this... Um, transaction. Mom and dad bought our house from us and turned it into a rental back in Portland. And so we had enough money to um, buy this double wide on contract. <clears throat> and so uh, mom and dad had given us the down payment and uh, in the form of a cashier's check and I lost the check. And it came time for closing, and I went to get it out of my purse, and it wasn't in my purse. And I got sick to my stomach, and, and I thought, well, huh, what should we do? Oh, let's pray about that. <laughs> so we prayed about that with the kids before the kids went off to school. This is before we were homeschooling the kids. We prayed about that, and I, I, the kids went off to school, and within 30 minutes after the kids were in school, I got a phone call. Is this Mrs. Grammon? Yes, it is. Um, do you know a Gary or Sandra Strubar? Yes, I do. Those are my parents. Um, are you missing a check? Yes, well, this is U.S. Bank uh, in Gresham, Oregon calling. I'm thinking, I left my check in Gresham? I don't think so. <laughs> Long story short, the check had been found by someone but had dropped out of my purse. I do not know how that could have happened, but it dropped out of my purse and someone in the parking lot turned it into the bank and they had to trace it back to, back to the issuer. And, and they called my parents and of course, thank God my parents knew us and said, yes, call this number because closing was that day. So David went to the school and got the kids out of school to tell them that God is the God of the lost check. And we went on from there. So he's the God of the lost check. If you've heard Jeremy's tractor key story, he's the God of the lost tractor keys. And the Lord repeated that again in Quincy, Washington, not uh, long afterwards, where some one of the young men that had been at this retreat, and this was a youth camp, one of them that had been at this retreat accidentally took off with the keys in his pocket that after loading the van. <clears throat> Um, of everybody else's things and they lived a long ways away and so they had left early but he didn't know that he had the keys in his pocket to the van and so David had shared the story of the tractor keys at this retreat and so one of the pastors said okay Grammon, put your money where your mouth is here's some lost keys shall we pray about that so all the campers that were still there gathered around in a circle, and they began to pray that those keys be found. No one really knew where those keys were, including the kid who had them. And so they began to pray, and guess what? As they were praying in the circle, a lady from the church office came running out to tell them they've been found. <laughs> They're an hour and a half away in a kid's pocket, but as they started to pray, this kid and his companions decided to stop, get off the freeway at a McDonald's. And when he reached in his hand to pay for his burger, there were the van keys. 
So they called the office. Now all those young men got to experience the God of the keys. And I want you to begin to think as we go through to this testimony that I'm going to share with you today about your experiences. He's the God of your something or other. Okay? And I want you to begin to make a list. So on the back of that piece of paper, I want you to begin making a list of the favors of God that pop into your head. Things he's done for you. Answered prayers. Serendipities. Wahoos. Okay? And so this is, this is the beginning of your testimony, of your connection, and the pursuit of God on your life and the relationship that he wants with you. It's all very personal. My serendipitous things won't turn your, or flip your switch probably, but they flipped mine. It's pretty cool. All right. So some of the other things that happened while we were in Cove is that David started a business. I told the Lord, I don't want to work at Eastern Oregon Title and Escrow anymore. And so I would really like to not have to work this. And he said, I'm not making you. And, and I'm like, well, we need the money. And he goes, I don't need your help to provide for you. Now, there was a whole blow my mind. What do you mean you don't need my help? I'm very good at what I do, and I make a lot of money. And we need, we need that money. And he's like, I don't, I don't need your help. I was offended. And then I thought, well, what if that's true? What if that's true that he doesn't need my help to take care of me? Hadn't been my experience. But then I'd never given him a chance. Because I was, remember the apple tree from last week? The apple tree was, I made a decision that I would be in control all the time. And if it's to be, it's up to me. And I could not rely on anyone else. And the Lord said to me, I don't need your help. So uh, I did what all really... Well, let me, let me say this. That David had just started a business 30 days earlier in construction. <clears throat> and I thought, this is not good timing, Lord. This is a brand new business. And <laughs> he just said nothing. He'd already said what he needed to say, and then it was up to me. So I thought, huh. Okay. So I quit my job, and I didn't tell David. I just quit it and came home. And David, I came home to tell David, hey, babe, guess what I did? He's like, what'd you do? I said, I quit my job. You did what? <laughs> I guess the Lord didn't tell David that <laughs> he didn't need my help. But um, that became another opportunity for me to learn some important, crazy, cool things about my God. So I shared this beautiful flower arrangement with you. It is really a spectacular arrangement with all of its strangeness. But I want you to know that this is a symbol of the love of God. It is culturally inelegant. And it is not something that I would recommend that any of you men put together for someone that you want to impress. But I want you to know that this is a treasure in my heart. This ugly, dairy gold milk carton full of strange mixes of fresh and silk and plastic. And yeah. But I want you to know that this is a symbol to me of an awakening. This is that a retreat I went to where God wrecked me and he said, I'm not like you think I am. I'm not like that. I'm not like that. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure you are. And he's like, I'm not. And I'm going to prove it to you. So David's new business was called Mill Creek Construction, which we have lovingly renamed Mill Creek Construction and Rehab because the Lord had some divine training that we needed to have and some divine experiences for the call on our life, which we didn't know we had. Okay, we, we had no idea where we were going. We were just in love and in cove, which was heaven. 
And then I was, and I was unemployed, <laughs> which was interesting. So uh, Mill Creek Construction and Rehab, um, what divine training was that we did not know what we did not know, and part of it was that our entire crew was high on meth. We thought they were just really fast <laughs> and really good. And our, uh, our main guy, Steve Laprell, was a maniac. I mean, he was just like crazy good until he wasn't. And uh, when they started, we, we had David and Jeremy did this together, <clears throat> and we had a construction business that set double wides and triple wide, tw triple wide homes. And so, yeah, that's a very dangerous business to be high on meth when you're rolling those giant uh, pieces together and you're under them and you're setting pier blocks. But we learned a good lesson there. <clears throat> the next lesson that we learned was that when you own your own business, people don't just pay you when they say they're going to pay you. And so I was, it was, I was terrified every month when it came to payroll because I'm thinking I've got all these men that are relying on us to pay them their salaries so that they can pay their bills and support their families. Now, this was a heavy thing on me. And I should have had ulcers with the amount of fussing I did and angst that I carried because every time payroll would come around, I'm thinking, would you do something here? Because all of these people are depending on us. <clears throat> after many months of the Lord providing for us payroll after payroll after payroll, and yes, sometimes right on the day. Some of it was right on the day. Sometimes it was a week before, but sometimes it was a day before. Month after month after month of anxiety and fear. And the orphan spirit in me said, I cannot trust you. How can I trust you when you're so dang slow? So I'm having this out with the Lord, and he said to me, how many times do I have to make payroll for you to believe that I'll always make payroll and that I'll take care of everything? Oh. Right. That kind of, hmm. well, I don't know. <laughs> this had been a year, by the way, that we'd been in business really well, by the way, even though it was month to month. It was very well month to month until it wasn't, <laughs> until we were waiting for the next people to pay. And the Lord said to me, how many times do I have to do this in order for you to trust me? <clears throat> so this was the Lord letting me know that he was the God of provision. This was more divine training because never again from that day forward have we ever had, oh, that's not true. Okay, only one other time. From that time on, did we ever have income that was a guaranteed income? And, of course, it wasn't guaranteed either. But I'm just going to say, David and I have lived on faith, believing God for provision, every day from that time on. And we had to know this, or we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing. <clears throat> so then, at the end of this beautiful period of time in Cove, we went back into ministry, and David went to work as a pastor at... Uh, the Lebanon church, and he did have a paycheck there. Um, <clears throat> right after Walk to Emmaus, we started a study called Experiencing God. And this is another one of those serendipitous things where a pastor who had um, been to one of these walks to Emmaus says, you know, David, that's just the first step. This is the next step. You and Christy need to look at this workbook. And so we worked on this workbook, and it's called Knowing and Doing the Will of God by Henry Blackaby and Claude King. And these were not authors from our denomination. And um, so we thought, well, okay, we'll, we'll read this book. And we got wrecked right away. Um, I'm going to just, I left it on my chair, excuse me. So I just kind of want to go through that. Uh, 
summary because I'm going to refer back to this a lot. He, in this workbook, he states these things. God is always at work around you. Number two, God pursues a continuing love relationship with you that is real and personal. Say real and personal. God is pursuing a love relationship with you that is real and personal. Number three, God invites you to become involved with him in his work. He wants to partner with you. You have a purpose on the earth. Everybody wants to know, why was I born? Here's why you were born. You were born to partner with God to do son and daughter things in the kingdom of the Father on the earth. I, okay, this is a blow your mind moment. If you don't know that the God who created the world, the universe, and you wants you to be a partner of his to do divine things like miracles, yeah, you're all supposed to be doing miracles. Say, I'm supposed to be doing miracles. I'm the light of the world, I'm the salt of the earth. This is sonship. This is belonging. This is partnership. This is family. When you come into the family of God, it should mean something. It shouldn't just look like, hey, I go to church at Faith Foundry and sing songs. Or I go to ER and I'm clean and sober. Boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, that is, that's barely being born. That's not even toddlerhood. What I want you to know is that sons and daughters have to grow up into relationship with Abba. Now, I was a son, I was a daughter, and I was supposed to be a son, but no, I wasn't. But no, I wasn't. He doesn't make any mistakes, right? And I was not a mistake, and my gender was not a mistake. So God invited me to come and get involved with him in his work. Then the fourth thing was God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. And in Lebanon, our study came to a grinding halt because... We, do, we did believe by then that God spoke through the Holy Spirit. We did know that he spoke through the word of God. We did know that he spoke through prayer and circumstances, but we didn't believe that he spoke through the church. We were very disillusioned by the church, and here it rolled around again, and David was pastoring at a church that wanted change but didn't want to be changed. And so when we brought all of the fresh revelation that the Lord had been giving us about how interactive God was and how God has a plan to use the church to minister and to grow and to love on a community, they were still very committed to their building project. And we were disillusioned. So we kind of had to put that aside for a time. Okay, number six was you must make major adjustments. No, wait, sorry. Number five, God's invitation for you to work with him always leads you to a crisis of belief that requires faith and action. You have all come to one of those intersections in your life where God has invited you to take the next step and it looked too scary and it looked like the cost might be too high, and you weren't sure that he was going to do what he needed to do in order for you to be success. And that looked like, "Mm, I don't think so. And we didn't do it. We didn't accept the invitation to join him at work because I didn't have the right letters after my name, or I didn't have uh, a guaranteed income, or I didn't have you put your own stuff in there and write something down on your paper because you've all had an invitation from God to do something and you've declined. And you know why I know that? Because you're a human being. And we all do that. Number six, you must make major adjustments in your life in order to join God in what he's doing. That's why you have to have the faith. (laughs) 
Because you have to have the faith in order to make the adjustment in order to do what he's calling you to do. And it's mostly a mental adjustment, but let me tell you, it was a lot of other kinds of adjustment for us as well. Number seven, you come to know God by experience as you respond. This one says obey, but I'm going to say respond to the invitation and make the adjustment. You come to know God by experience as you obey him and he accomplishes his work through you. As you respond to that prompting, God can use that. He can work with that. So I'm going to just tell you that this study was foundational for David and I to do everything else that we've said yes to in our life. Without understanding these principles, we would still be doing whatever. I don't know. I'm pretty sure we'd be in business because David and I are both entrepreneurs and we know how to make money. And the Lord's like, yeah, but that's not what I called you to do. And so I'm going to tell you that we are not making money right now. But I want you to know that all of my needs are met. And I've been valentined like crazy. So <clears throat> we left Lebanon and came to work with my dad at Newton Creek Church here in Roseburg. My dad was a senior pastor there. Um, and it was a going on thing. Everywhere my dad was was a going on thing because my dad was a lover and my dad was a great um, speaker, a very inspirational, and he was just a lover. And so people were attracted to that and we had a wonderful little group of folks over on Newton Creek. I was invited to uh, come and be the associate pastor with him. And so we moved to Roseburg and we got a call, before we even got here, we got a call from a caseworker that had been referred to us who said, are you still living in your RV or do you have a house yet? This was the day we were supposed to move in. And she invited us to partner and take in a little nine-year-old boy. <clears throat> and he was our very first um, foster son. And things changed really big then. That was a crisis of belief and a major adjustment, and we began to experience God in a whole new way. So that was in 1998. Adam arrives. He's nine years old. He's from the Albany Children's Farm Home, which was telling DHS, get him out of here. We're done. He's nine years old. When we went to pick him up, we were sitting around this table in this meeting room, and here's this little nine-year-old boy with really big, thick glasses. And they made him say, now, Adam, you know why you're here, right? And I'm thinking, this is a big meeting room, and we're in a horseshoe like this is a conference, and there's lots of spaces between, and we're over here, and he's over there, and, and the caseworker and the foster provider and the children's farm home people were over here. And here's Adam sitting all by himself with his attorney. Did you know nine-year-olds needed an attorney? I didn't before then. But here's his attorney. So, Adam, you know why, you know why you're here? Yeah, I, I got in trouble again. And, and so then they had him list. And can you tell us, do you know uh, what medications you're on? He lists all these medications. And then, and do you know what your diagnosis is? Here comes the diagnosis. Yes, I have, this is a nine-year-old. I have ADHD, uh, oppositional defiance. I have reactive attachment disorder. I didn't know what any of those were, but he did because he'd been drilled into his head all of the diagnoses, all the behavioral things that were wrong with this kid. And he's like, when he gets all done, he said, it, the caseworker said, well, I understand that you're on the very top level at school. And he sits up real tall and he goes, yeah, I've been on it for three weeks. And she goes, well, what is your plan to stay on that, Adam? He's nine. And he says, um, keep doing good. And the caseworker says, yes, and we know that that's not possible for you. And so what is your plan? And David is digging his hands into my knee because he's about ready to leap over the table and choke that person. And I'm like, down, boy, down. <laughs> I want you to know that this is true for our kids in the foster system who've all been labeled, but this was more divine training. We didn't know what we didn't know. 
Adam came home with us. Thank God Holly came home with us too. Because Jeremy and David had a new, a new construction business. Remember, we, we didn't want to be on the church's payroll, so David decided we'll just go ahead and start a construction business over here. It did so well there, and Jeremy's like, okay, I'm in. And so Jeremy and David started a construction business, and, <clears throat> and Adam and I were home alone. And Holly and Jeremy were in love and getting ready to be married. And so because they were on the road and I could not do Adam by myself, Holly came to live with us. And Holly has the gift of gentle. And I do not. I mean, I do now, but I did not. I did not have the case of that whole thing because I had to control everything, remember? I had to, this boy had to come into alignment with good behaviors now, yesterday. And so uh, I knew how to parent. I have beautiful, wonderful, well-developed children. And yet he didn't respond to anything. He did not understand cause and effect at all. He was on seven different medications, some in the morning, to wake him up and some in the evening to calm him down and help him sleep. But it was even blood pressure medication to reduce the level of blood pressure so that he wouldn't rage. Do you know they do that still? Hello. I want you to be aware. They're medicating our kids. They're medicating our kids to control their behaviors because they have no answers. None. And they have no understanding. More divine training. So as I had this little boy in my home, every, uh, and I was exposed to a true orphan. He was a true orphan. Um, he'd been in the system since he was an infant. Angry, hostile, resentful, controlling, self-preservation, fearful, distrustful, couldn't receive love, wouldn't receive love, taking, grasping, hurtful. It's all about me. This was my little guy. I won't let you love me. I can't trust you. I won't trust you. <clears throat> Divine training. Exposed my orphan spirit. My orphan spirit, every ugly thing that I didn't know was in me, came out and was on full display for everyone to see. Bless the Lord. Andrea's okay. So this has been about... 23 days with no seizure. So this is really good. So praise the Lord. So just give her the grace right now to just take your eyes off of her and stick with me. All right? So I, I bless you for that. Jesus is healing her in a divine way. All right. So this was another major crisis for me because I had to make some major adjustments my orphan spirit, every ugly thing that I didn't know was in me, came out and everyone could see it. And they were upset by what they saw in me because I was not in control and I did not know how to manage where I was, this thing that I had decided that we had said yes to. I'm just gonna say that. This was one of those things where the Lord had said, yes, I want you to do this. And we had said, yes, we will. And we'd made a commitment to do it. So all of this came through, and Adam was with us. We moved um, into a ranch out in Camas Valley. David went into the Serenity Lane uh, internship program to learn about drugs and alcohol, because everywhere we went, people were addicted to drugs and alcohol, and they don't teach you that stuff in seminary. This is when I met Carol Embry. Carol Embry was um, a counselor who worked with me and Adam and <laughs> she told me in my first visit kids like Adam don't get better I don't know what they told you Mrs. Grammon because I came in with like all right here we are to save the day God's got a plan and you're part of it and she's like um no here's what I can do for you I can show you how to cope with his behaviors. And I thought, I'm really not up for that. She goes, that's all you can get. 
Okay, she, and I said, well, aren't you forgetting the God factor? And they said, she said to me, oh, you're one of those. <laughs> and uh, so I, she said, okay. So she had a belief, a foundational belief in God. Um, she said, here's what we'll do. You bring Adam to counseling, and I'll talk to him for 15 minutes or so, and then you can come in here and we'll make a case plan. We'll make a case plan, and you can go home and practice it for as long as it works, and as soon as it stops working, we'll make a new plan. I said, perfect. That began a really long time of learning, divine training, 11 years working with this wonderful counselor. In, in the 11 years, we got lots more boys, <laughs> And we would load them up in the van, because she was in Reedsport. We would load them up in the van and take them down there, and we would spend half a day in the uh, atrium out there. And each boy would go in and do 15 minutes. Okay? Each boy would go in and do 15 minutes. And then I would go in with Carol, and we would write that week's plan for that child. We did tons of research. When I would say, isn't there a book for this? Isn't there a curriculum for this? Isn't there, you know, they've got all these diagnoses. With a diagnosis should come an answer. She goes, no, they just diagnose it so they can medicate it. But they don't have any answers. So we went digging 2,500 plus hours of one-on-one -on -one mentoring, research, and case planning I spent with Carol Embry. She is an amazing woman, an amazing woman. And I bless her because the Lord used her to train me. I want you to think about how the Lord is training you. What has he put in your life to teach you? What is he teaching you? What is he showing you? Something has been happening for you where this is God showing himself to you in a relational way. This was growing me up in my trust and in my training. Adam was such a handful, we thought, well, he needs a little brother. <laughs> so we took Josh, not the Josh who's with us now, but we took another little boy named Josh, and he was associated with Scar Jasper Mountain, and that formed a relationship of more training. Scar Jasper Mountain is in a wonderful... Um, residential treatment facility that takes kids up to age 11. And if they weren't well enough to return home, then they would go into foster care or a residential tre another residential treatment center if they would take anybody over 11. Usually they went into um, lockdown. <clears throat> so we teamed up with this place because they'd heard about us and we got our second child. And... That began a wonderful relationship with them, and we got more divine training for free. Oh, and they actually paid us to do that. Wouldn't that be nice if you all went to school and got paid to go to school? <laughs> that works out really good. <laughs> so then um, we got a 30-day notice uh, to move off of the Camas Valley Ranch. We had a ranch, folks. We had horses and sheep. Yeah, we had stuff. And we needed to move in 30 days. Well, David and I, like I said, we only had enough money um, to make each bill each month, okay? But we had no extras, um, and we were going to have to move. This was unexpected because we thought we were going to be there for several years, but this guy decided to take early retirement and come home. So we got a hold of a realtor, and nobody wanted to talk to us because we had no money. It's really tough to deal with realtors when you don't have any money. They really don't want to drive you around except for Patty Cooper, I'm just going to tell you, Patty Cooper is an angel of the Lord, and she's still with us, and she's still believing for the ranch that we're going to have for the men. When we had no money, she drove us around, and we looked at ranch after ranch after ranch that wouldn't work, wouldn't work, wouldn't work, wouldn't work. And somebody called us and said, you need to go look at this one place out on Looking Glass. And we went there, and we called Patty. And we said, Patty, this looks perfect for us. Um, could you show it to us? She goes, yeah, be right there. So she came and she showed us the ranch and she told us how much it was. And we said, we don't have anywhere close to that. And she said, well, they, it says here that they might consider carrying a contract. We thought, 
Bingo, bango, bongo. It was 116 acres. It was two parcels. The front parcel was five acres, and there was 111 acres behind. And we said, well, there's no way we could do that. I mean, we don't have a down payment. And she goes, well, let's go and make a ridiculous offer and just see what happens. What's the worst that could happen, Christy? He could say no. But you need to ask in order to hear him say no. So this was a Sunday. We went into the office Sunday afternoon, and we wrote a ridiculous offer. We offered him $10,000 down, which we had no, we did not have $10,000. We thought we were going to get a $2,500 tax return that never came. Okay, but we're sitting in there. We write the offer. We sign the offer, and we get a phone call on my cell, and it's one of the families from church saying, you need to go look at this ranch. Did you see this ranch in the newspaper? It says for sale or lease. Did you look at that? Yeah, we just made an offer on it. Oh, I said, but you need to pray about it because we don't have enough money for the down payment. Well, we're going to commit our tax return to you. We're going to give it to you. Oh, wow, wow, God. Patty's like, this is cool. (laughs) And so then the phone rings again, and it's our kids. Jeremy's like, Mom, Dad, you need to go see this ranch. (laughs) And we're like, yeah, we just made an offer on it. And -and so-and-so just gave a pledge of their tax return, and Jeremy and Holly go, we're in. You'll get ours, too. And then we got another phone call. Now, those pledges didn't quite come to $10,000, but I want you to know that $10,000 came when it needed to come. And when we sat down and talked to this, to this buyer, I mean the seller, he heard our story. By the way, you don't ever get to talk to a seller. You don't ever get, that's unheard of. And we begged Patty, and Patty made it happen. And she goes, he needs to know your story, that you've got boys, and you need, you know, you need a boys' ranch. And so he had been a foster parent. And so against all odds, he said yes. His realtor said, sign this paper, this disclaimer. I'm telling you not to do it. If it comes back on you, it's on you, not me. Against all odds. By the way, the seller's name was Joe Money. God has such an amazing sense of humor. Doesn't he? Joe Money. I love that man. He blessed us hugely. Without him, we wouldn't have had a boys' ranch. So then, another crisis of belief comes along, and uh, we had to have two balloon payments. Uh, This was the crazy, this was the crazy uh, offer we made. Yes, in faith. Every year for the next two years, we'll make a 10, 000, another $10,000 balloon payment. And then at the end of the third year, we'll exercise the option to buy the back 11, 111 acres that we were going to be leasing. And so what happens? Well, 12 months goes by, and of course, we have no $10,000. And our, our first partners, George and Mavis Moore from Lebanon, who were um, amazing people and are still sending us monthly support to this day, uh, came up with that money for us as a gift. And the next year, my grandparents called me and said, "Um, you kids need to come visit us. And so we said, okay, good. So David and I took a day off and went to visit Grandma and Grandpa. And when we got there, we found out that they had invested $1,000 in silver coins a year ago. And that thousand dollars in silver coins had now grown to be ten thousand dollars that's a what baby i mean two years later thank you two years later in two years it's a pretty good return on their money what do you think and so the balloon payment was the second balloon payment was made are you guys tracking with me are you seeing how god is divinely providing for how we're suppo- how we are to partner with him. He knows that we cannot do this on our own. He knows that. And we said yes anyway. And because of our yes, we're growing up in the Lord. We're believing God for amazing things. We ended up doing crazy things like scrap metal 
That's another story, and I'm not going to tell you about it today. But provision came through scrap metal, and that scrap metal saved us because in 2008, everything came crashing down. <clears throat> Jack and Tammy Trowbridge are angels of the Lord. They own <laughs> North Star Trailer Works. Isn't it great Northern Trailer Works? Yeah, great Northern Trailer Works. And he built us um, a trailer, a flatbed trailer, and gave it to us. And we hauled scrap metal. And that's when scrap metal was worth a lot of money. And that's what got us through the major 2008 crisis. But right in 2008, David was uh, told by the church that he was ministering at, um, we have a different vision um, than you, and he, and he was let go. And uh, the, because our vision was working with really high-risk boys, um, our, our church there had declined to be on our board um, because of the risk. The risk was too great. So we were feeling orphaned ourselves from our church family, and we had orphans in our home, and the Lord goes, I'm just going to immerse you in this because I want you to understand what the orphan spirit looks like. I want you to know how it feels. I want you to know what it does because I have a better plan for you. I want you to know also what sonship looks like, feels like, okay? Because that's where you're headed. I already was a daughter, but I was just a really immature daughter, and I had lots to learn about my Abba. So in this time of, I'm gonna say, extreme stress, where we lost a third of our income immediately when David was laid off, and then... Uh, <laughs> We had lots of boys, and we'd started the uh, day treatment, which was the academy, and we were barely making it. But oh, the miracles of God. Somebody once told us, you guys do more with less than anybody I know. <laughs> Guess what? It's a little bit like when, um, what's the, what's the, um, I'm having a, a brain where the Lord says, um, you're going to only have this much, and then you're going to have less, and then you're going to have less, and it's going to get even worse than this before it gets any better. I can't think of the story, but it's in the Bible. Anyway, where you think you're at your rock bottom, and he's like, no, there's a, there's a, different, there's a lower bottom, and you're going to go there. And so we did. But in the middle of that bottom... In 2008, that was David's and my 30th wedding anniversary. And <laughs> the Lord sent us to Europe on free air miles from 20 years ago when he and I had been doing a jewelry business. All those trips back and forth that we'd won to Europe that they paid for accrued free air miles for David and I. And we had two international round-trip flights, and those miles were about ready to expire. And I thought, well, we could go to the East Coast, and I've never seen, you know, in the fall, I've never been seeing the, the beautiful leaves on the East Coast in the fall. And David says, babe, these are international flights. Let's go back to Europe. And I'm like, we don't have any money. We don't have to have money. <laughs> We've got the airlines, and we already had, oh, you guys, I have so many stories that I could tell you, but I'm going to tell you, but somehow or other, in a divine, supernatural, incredible story, we got two weeks of a timeshare, and this timeshare actually was transferable, and so we just got to use our timeshare for free over in Europe. This is in the middle of a very big financial crisis, David and I went to Europe. Okay, you got my, here we are. And then I want to show you this. So I want you to see these things hanging on there. Those are bells. And David and I, it was wonderful because we weren't worth a tour, tour group this time. And so we were in beautiful Switzerland. We went back to Switzerland. And uh, we were up in a ski encampment clear up at the top of the mountains. This is beautiful. And uh, we rented a car. 
And at the crash, when we got over there, the euro crashed, and our dollar was worth double. And so we, what little money we had was doubled right then, right when we got off the plane. It was awesome. And so we got this hot little car that went really fast, and there aren't any... Uh, no. <laughs> there aren't any speed limits in Europe and Switzerland and Italy and whatnot. It's really, really fun to drive there. So we did a lot of driving. So as we were driving in the countryside, we're riding in the car and I'm hearing this sound. Now, Davy. Now, it was a little more muted than that because that's when I got out of the car to take these pictures, okay? But when we were in the car, you could hear these bells. I'm like, what is that? That's crazy cool. You know the song that says, the hills are alive with the sound of music. Yeah, la, 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 la. <laughs> this is it. This is what she's talking about in that song. I never knew what the sound of music was. I'm telling you, look what I got, guys. This was the only souvenir I brought home. I was so in love with the thought of that song and how it was expressed and how it was sung. I had to have some. This was the most expensive thing that we did on that trip, and I think it cost us 60 euros which is 30 bucks. But 60 euros is a lot. Maybe it's 80 euros. Anyway, I didn't care. I had to have that because that was the Lord romance me, O oh lover of my soul. This was the Lord romancing me. He's an amazing God. It was an amazing trip. Well, I have to tell you this. <laughs> On that drive, we ended up in this valley that you saw before, and we were at a beautiful church, old church. There's churches everywhere there. Old church, and we were standing in the courtyard of that church, and you could hear all the hills around jingling, but from a distance, in all different tones, because the little guys, like the sheeps, they wear the little bells. And the big guys were the big bells, okay? And so it was every tone in between. It was amazing. Favor of God, serendipity. <clears throat> then Joseph Vu came to live with us. He was a brand new Christian. Um, somebody called us when he was on the steps of Applebee's playing a, whor a, a recorder, completely off tune. And he was homeless, didn't know, have a place to be. And the Lord told us to bring him home. So we brought him home to the boys' ranch. And uh, this is us saying yes when none of that makes sense. He was about 22 when he came to us. He didn't really know his birthday. He was from um, Vietnam, Dave? He was from Vietnam. And... He came in like a whirlwind and said, you guys need this book. It was called God's Creative Power, The Tongue, Creative Force. And so I, we, oh, thank you, Joseph. Huh, we'll do that. And so I start thumbing through it, and I'm like, ooh, well, this is different. Well, this is really different. Well, this is really different. This is the same guy that told Jeremy, you need to be speaking in tongues. And this is Jeremy. I'm pretty sure that if God wanted me to speak in tongues, I would be doing it by now. you got to know that in our past religious experience, speaking of tongues was a bad thing, bad news. You don't do that. It's not from God, and it's fake, and you shouldn't do it because all of that is gone and passed away. And so we, we were like, no, we don't speak in tongues. And Joseph is like, you need to listen to me. The Lord says you need to speak in tongues. And Jeremy's like, okay. All right, I'll ask the Lord. If you want me to speak in tongues, I'll speak in tongues. Guess what? We all speak fluently. 
exuberantly, spontaneously in tongues. And do you know that this is the sweetest, most wonderful connection to Abba? Because guess what it does? It disengages my brain. And my spirit gets to be with Abba. And Abba talks to Holy Spirit that's in my, in my body, and Holy Spirit speaks to my spirit. And it has been such a huge blessing in our lives. I'm almost done. So Joseph Vu brought to us another divine learning, not just about speaking in tongues, but it brought to our awareness that we were speaking everything that we didn't want. We were speaking all of our fears and all of our lack. I can remember that we, we were paying our bills, but they were not on time. And eventually, we weren't able to pay our bills at all. And I told the Lord, you are ruining my credit. This is another late payment. And you wouldn't have to pay a late fee if you just get the money here on time. I knew the money was coming from him. Okay? You are ruining my credit. And he goes, this is what he said to me. Credit was not my idea. And I don't care about your credit score. And you aren't ever going to need it. Culturally, you have expectations that are completely out of the sphere of where God operates. God did not create this culture. <laughs> okay, some of you think that's true. God did not create this culture. This is a broken, broken system, in case you haven't noticed. God did not create this culture. He has a heavenly culture, and I needed to get in that. I need to associate with that. I needed to learn that. I needed to get involved in that. <laughs> More divine training. It came to be that the Lord was going to invite us one more time to do a really big thing, and that was to let the ranch go back because we were orphaned by everyone in the community. This is how it is with a boy's ranch. Oh, you guys are doing such a great work. We're so glad you're doing it. Here's 20 bucks. Thanks, that's a third of a tank of gas. <laughs> right? So I want you to know that it was a very lonely time for us. We felt very much alone, and yet the Lord sent us wonderful ministers to come alongside and encourage us and help us and keep our noses above water. But the Lord allowed the ranch to go back. And I'm going to say that this was more divine training because you see the Lord needed to extract us out of that vision and bring us into a greater vision. We thought we knew that the Lord wanted us to have a boy's ranch and the Lord's going, mm -hmm, good job, kids, that you're just really willing to do that. But no, you need to come over here and have a men's ranch. And you need to work with men and adults because children have no power to make changes culturally. But men do. Men do. Men who are healed, men and women who are healed and know who they are, who are extracted out of orphan spirit and into sonship, yeah, those are the guys and I have a vision for a city. I have a vision for a region, and it's not going to happen with a boy's ranch. We didn't know that then. So when we lost the boy's ranch, it was humiliating. It was sh shame came upon us in a huge blanket. The church just kind of shook their head and said, yeah, yeah, did you hear about what's happened to the Grammans? Yeah, did you hear they're losing the ranch? and nobody came to help us and nobody came to ask except for two realtors two Christian realtors came to us and said what can we do to help you and we said well thank you but we're not supposed to have any help and they said oh and when we told them what had happened that we'd even had a cash offer on the rent do you, I'm telling this part you can go home if you want to or you can stay here because I'm going to finish We'd had a cash offer for the ranch. And a dream came to this guy. We didn't ever know him. He wasn't from our state. And in the dream, were they believers, Davey? 
I, can't, I don't even know if they were believers. But the, but the realtor on the other side came to us and said, um, I'm sorry, the offer's been uh, retracted. I'm like, how do you retract an offer? And he's like, well, there's this loophole and this loophole. He gets out. And I said, what happened? And he goes, well, are you ready for this? He called me and told me we had a dream. And in the dream... God showed up and told us, that's my ranch. You leave it alone. You are not to buy it. We said, okay, I guess we're going to give the, ban- the ranch away. You just took our buyer away, Lord. Weird. Divine. Heavenly realm, not earthly realm. And the Lord was moving us. So we lost the ranch. Somewhere in between that time, before we lost the ranch, we got uh, restore appliances and more from hauling scrap. And uh, the Lord told us, give the store away. Hey, could we just sell it, Lord? Could we sell the store? Nope, give it away. Could we lease it to somebody, Lord? Give it away. So we gave it to our head technician, And David was called into the jail to be the jail chaplain. Oh, on a volunteer basis. By the way, he's been a volunteer for over 10 years now. No pay for what he does. But he came home about a month later and said, I know why we lost the ranch. You know why? Yeah, because that was the wrong ranch. I'm supposed to be working with men because those are all our boys all grown up. In big boy bodies. Every, every person who is in jail, every person that's got a criminal record, every person that's an addict, every person that has been a train wreck in their life has had trauma in their life. And guess what? We were now trauma experts. Divine training. And the Lord said, shift. Go this way. Okay, yes, sir, Lord. Captain, my captain. Our yes every time has led to more of the heart of God. Every yes has led us into more of that divine connection, the God nod. There's nothing like the God nod on earth. And once you've had a God nod, you're super addicted to it. (laughs) That's all I got to say. Okay, so it makes you really brave to do crazy things that everybody else says, that's ridiculous. Oh, here's the best one. That's really unwise. Do you know how many times people came and said, even some of my family, what are you doing? That is really unwise. And wisdom, man's wisdom, has been elevated above God's wisdom. And so anything that looks like you can't handle it, control it, uh, project it, as, as in that there's a projection for success, if it doesn't look like it'll succeed, it's not wise. So God-sized things require a God, and you're not it. <laughs> You are his partner. You are his ambassador. You are his anointed one. And you have a purpose on the earth. And I'm talking to the men in the room today. Women, you count too. I'm a woman. But I want you to know that as the man goes, so goes everything else. I've got statistics to prove that. The Lord took us into... Daily worship. We've been doing daily worship for over 10 years now. Monday through Friday, worshiping. Worshiping when there was nobody but us there. Worshiping in Divine Home Furniture. Worshiping in Jeremy and Holly's living room. And then worshiping, this is Jeremy and Holly's living room. Yep, we smashed into there. (laughs) And then we moved to the Gateway District. And then we moved here. And we didn't come here because it was our idea. We came here because there was a pastor here starting a church, and he came and saw what we were doing and said, how much are you guys paying for this a month? And we told him, and he said, hey, how about you just save that for your ministry, come and use our building for free? And then he left. And then we had the 
everything that came with it. <laughs> and the Lord said, yep, this is where I want you to be, and this is how I want you to do it. Oh, and by the way, it's a great place to do CR. We'd been doing CR in another church because we didn't have a church of our own big enough, and we were doing it at the church on the rise. So, again, we embraced Celebrate Recovery and said, yeah, but there's more. There's more relationships. So we started Elevate Recovery, our own, which is a faith-based, and we focused on the spiritual principles. Why did we do that? We did that because we want you to come into a relationship with God. There is another step beyond clean and sober, and it's the most critical one. If you don't ever get to this, you'll probably remain in an orphan state, an immature son or daughter of God. Doesn't mean that you are not a daughter or a son of God, just means you don't know who you are yet, and you won't behave like you are designed to behave. You won't know intimately by relationship the one who loves you and is devoted to you. And you won't be able to be brave enough then to partner with him in things that look <clears throat> strange, to say the least. <laughs> so we are here now at Faith Foundry doing what God has called us to do. And along comes the Abba journey. And in the Abba journey comes affirmation after affirmation, after confirmation, after affirmation that the Lord is speaking. And if you're listening, you're hearing the same thing. And the authors of this series, the Lord was talking to them completely independent in a whole different area of ministry, but it was the same. And if when you're going through the Abba journey, if you don't recognize triumph over trauma, and if you don't recognize elevate recovery in there, then you need to come to Elevate Recovery again. <laughs> I want you to know that I have gotten to do crazy things like live out forgiveness with very close family members in a new way. The Lord has just given me opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to say, mm, yes, sir, Lord, I'll do that. Yes, I'll do that. Yes, I don't know how to do that, but you'll show me how. And that's what I want to leave you with today. <laughs> this is a relational experience. God is a relational God. You cannot know God just by reading the Bible. You must experience him. He will talk to you. He will do favors for you. He will get your tail out of a jam. He will rescue you. He will heal you. He will lead you, he will teach you, he will romance you. Amen. And this grows you up into maturity. Orphan doesn't know God by experience, might have some knowledge. But daughter and son, intimate connection and a deep knowingness that whatever I put my hand to prospers, that God is going to make a way where there seems no way. That's why his name is Yahweh. Right. That's all I got. That's, that's not the end of the story. And that's not the whole story. But that's too much for today. And what I want you to do now is to reach out your hand and think about what you're saying. Because you are proclaiming something to happen, okay, over others. So put one hand on your chest and the other hand out because you want this for yourself. Are you ready? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord smile down on you and show you his kindness. The Lord answer your prayers and give you his peace. The Lord cover you with his name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Today is fun and powerful. Happy Valentine's Day.